Unsolved mysteries interest people for various reasons. Many people are drawn to the unknown and the unexplained, and unsolved mysteries provide a sense of mystery and wonder. The mystery surrounding the Georgia Guidestone's last moments. Someone has just revealed a small detail moments before the Georgia Guidestones were destroyed. The Georgia Guidestones was a granite monument located in Elbert County, Georgia, USA. It was erected in 1980 and consisted of four massive upright stones with a capstone on top and a central pillar that supported the capstone. The monument was inscribed with a set of ten guidelines or principles written in eight modern languages and a shorter message at the top of the structure written in four ancient languages. The guidelines or principles, often referred to as the Ten Commandments of the New Age, call for a balanced and sustainable approach to life on Earth, with respect for nature and human rights, and a focus on maintaining a peaceful and harmonious global community. The identity of the person or group responsible for the Georgia Guidestones is unknown, as the monument was commissioned through a pseudonym and the true identity of the commissioning party has never been revealed. Since the Georgia Guidestones were taken down, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has yet to identify any suspects related to the incident. Oddly enough, a soldier was watching the footage of the stones being destroyed when they noticed a small detail. The soldier reported that they have extensive knowledge when it comes to these types of explosions and said that something seemed off. He said the following, I did three combat tours in Iraq, and I've seen my fair share of IEDs, EFPs, and JDAMs. That was not a standard conventional munition. There was no blast wave, no collateral damage, zero crater, and that was something powerful enough to absolutely destroy solid granite and not even touch the surrounding structure. Something extremely accurate, more accurate than any GPS-guided munition that is known. My guess would be this is something that is not operational or doesn't exist. I'd say that's an energy-based weapon, and not conventional explosives. End quote. Interestingly, directed energy weapons are currently being used by the United States military. Directed energy weapons are a type of non-projectile technology that utilizes either electromagnetic or particle energy to strike a target. Unlike traditional weapons that rely on propellants to launch projectiles, directed energy weapons accomplish their aim through the manipulation of energy. In recent years, this technology has matured, leading to an increase in funding to support the ongoing research. Directed energy weapons are a set of advanced technologies that have the potential to transform modern warfare by reducing the risk of collateral damage. These weapons operate on the principle of manipulating electromagnetic or particle radiation to damage or destroy targets with precision and efficiency. Many questions remain with users saying that the footage didn't look right, saying why would they only release a short 10-second video that cuts really quickly into another shot. At the time, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was asking people for their help in identifying what happened, but then didn't release the footage in the lead up to the event. This has led to some confusion, with many users echoing the same comments, asking why they would release only a small section of the footage with others saying that officials clearly have cameras in the area and so questioned why they wouldn't just rewind it and show the public what happened moments before. One user said that the footage looks strange and said that there appears to be several cuts throughout it, suggesting that it was tampered with before it was released to the public. As of right now, many questions remain and we are still no closer to understanding who took down the stones. The Aztec Pyramid's Ancient Power Source Located in modern-day Mexico is a wide variety of evidence of an even larger and more influential presence that once resided in the area. This presence is known as the Great Empire of the Aztec Civilization that saw an incredible level of growth, economic might, and land control during its prime. Interestingly enough, despite many of the modern-day citizens of Mexico descending from this ancient culture, there is still a lot we don't know about the ancient civilization and its strange ways. One of the biggest questions surrounding these people was their fascination and construction of pyramids of a massive size that rival that of the Egyptian civilization. Even more peculiar, as researchers were busy studying the engravings and stone writings down near the base of the pyramids, referred to as the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Moon, 
They believed that the mythologies of the pyramids would be revealed if they continued their work there and had no plans to make any other attempts for the foreseeable future. It would soon be revealed to them that even more secrets surrounding the function of the pyramid would appear at a much lower part of the ancient Aztec construction that would help shed some light as to the main functions of the pyramid structures as well as cause new theories to grow in response to these discoveries. Interestingly, it appears that researchers have discovered that underneath the ground, there appears to be even more constructions and mysteries to uncover. Located below the massive Aztec pyramid, known as the Temple of the Sun, there seems to be an intricate detail of underground passages and areas one could enter. Many have pointed to these tunnels as being used as possible aqueducts or passageways for priests of their time, though nothing conclusive has been found that supports this theory. Others believe that the force of the underwater pressure could be used as a primitive method of energy generation that could be used for a wide variety of purposes. Similar theories were believed at the base of the Great Pyramids at Giza, when water tunnels were also found there decades in the past. This leaves many wondering if the pyramids served an additional purpose. The Mystery of the Silbury Hill Beings The county of Wiltshire is considered to be England's version of the Nevada Desert, as in recent years, it's become known as being a site of mysterious activity. Silbury Hill in Wiltshire is the largest man-made prehistoric mound in Europe, thought to have been built between 2470 and 2350 BC. Although its true purpose is uncertain, the strange events which occurred on a July morning in 2009 sparked people's imaginations. A police officer driving past Silbury Hill spotted three tall, blonde-haired figures, dressed in white overalls in the field near the hill. Initially, he thought they may be forensic officers, as they seemed to be inspecting the crop, so he decided to investigate. However, as he approached the field, things took a strange turn. At first, he heard a static noise, as if a current was running through the crops in the field. He reported that he felt the hair on his arms and back of his neck stand up, and began to feel uneasy. He shouted out to the figures, who initially ignored him. Upon entering the field, the figures turned around and began running. The officer noted that they were moving at a truly incredible speed before they suddenly vanished. Although the figures had disappeared from the officer's sight, the eerie electrical sound still hung in the air around him, almost like a paranormal medium reverberating in the field. It was at this point he began to feel truly scared, and so he hastily returned to his car only to be struck by a pounding headache that he couldn't shift. Since the occurrence, investigators have returned to the site to try and shed light on the matter. A researcher by the name of Colin Andrews returned to the site of the event afterwards with the policeman in question and quickly noticed that, from where the officer had been passing, it would have been very difficult to see the figures in the field. The officer said that he just knew something was in the field and that it was like he experienced some kind of psychic ability in the presence of the electrical static sound. However, the mystery did not end there, and in the days after the event, the police officer reported mysterious activity in his home. Andrews shed further light on these events, saying that they were common amongst those who had an experience. It was as if the officer had somehow connected with those figures. Whatever happened in those fields near Silbury Hill clearly took a toll on him, and judging by the evidence, it's quite possible that he did have an encounter with something not quite human. Coney Island Mothman Sighting Ever since the harrowing experiences seen on the night of the Silver Bridge collapse within the state of West Virginia, located in the small town of Point Pleasant, many have often believed that the Mothman creature had been at the epicenter of this strange occurrence. In fact, in many different witness accounts, it appears that the collapse of the Silver Bridge had been predicted by many who directly encountered the Mothman, a creature that seemed to be warning of the impending doom. However, researchers believe that another winged humanoid creature, reported several decades prior to the Mothman sightings of Point Pleasant, was also an indicator of doom sometime during the late 1800s. On the 12th of September, back in 1880, the New York Times published an article that claimed that an unidentified object mass sighting took place over the course of the day prior. Stating that there were many reputable persons who claimed to have seen an object in the sky hovering over New Jersey, the publication went on to describe that they believed a resident of New York City had perfected a homemade ornithopter, 
and was using the contraption to fly around as a publicity stunt. Crowds of people described that the hovering object was definitely in the shape of a man and flew at around the altitude of about 1,000 feet. Its flying contraption appeared to be a large set of bat's wings that made dramatic and fluid swimming-like movements through the air as he circled over crowds and continued in a specific direction following the rising wind currents. The crowds of witnesses could accurately and consistently describe the face of the winged man, claiming that he had an odd look on his face that looked cruel and determined as he continued flying through the sky with the flaps of its wings. The article then went on to explain that the winged man was incredibly hard to miss, as he appeared to have been completely black, with its wings, body and face having been a very dark matching colour without any evidence of artificial paint of any kind. The article then went on to puzzle over the strange display as the man then continued his flight towards the direction of New Jersey before disappearing from sight entirely. After the publication of the article, no pilot came forward to claim credit for the stunt and the event remains a mystery to this day. No known wing contraption that uses flapping motions for sustained thrust is proven capable of flight in the modern day. Some researchers have argued that the sighting of the Coney Island monster is actually a sighting of the well-known West Virginian creature referred to as the Mothman. Although not entirely understood, sightings of a winged humanoid creature within the area of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, were believed to have been connected with a catastrophic tragedy that would result in the passing of 46 individuals. Several months prior to the event, people within the town of Point Pleasant reported strange sightings of unidentified objects and a humanoid winged creature that was given the name of Mothman, and it was believed that these sightings were the manifestation of an omen that was attempting to warn the town's residents of the impending collapse of the Silver Bridge that would result in the passing of over 40 people. Although many might not be aware, the Mothman has been reported in many places all around the world, usually only a few days or moments before an accident or tragedy would take place. The Mothman creature, described as being an eight-foot-tall, moth-like monster, commonly described as having a large wingspan and flying away from eyewitnesses, has been seen by eyewitnesses for decades now, but it's only been in the last few years that the creature gained notoriety. Some hold the sentiment that the Mothman is attempting to change the future by making its presence known and warning people of a future disaster, whereas others believe that the Mothman is at the center of these disasters, acting as an active force to cause the tragedy. Given the fact that after the major tragedy following the Mothman's appearance, the creature will disappear from an area, never to be seen again, which establishes a direct connection between the creature and the tragedy itself. New theories have begun claiming the possibility that rather than predicting the future via supernatural means, the Mothman is capable of traveling through time via mechanical or scientifically plausible means and going back through time to try to change the tragic events from occurring. Evidence for this theory seems to grow surrounding strange predictive messages, dreams from witnesses, sightings of electrical power coming from the Mothman, or being absorbed by the Mothman, and some eyewitnesses' testimonies that claim a form of teleportation has been reported. Unfortunately, to this day, not much is known about the creature. The Mystery of Evelyn Rauch On the 15th of July, back in 1934, a strange missing persons report would come out of the small town of Rocky Mountain House, located out in Alberta, Canada, that would leave Father John Rauch and his friends under investigation from the local Royal Canadian Mounted Police for the disappearance of two-year-old Evelyn Rauch. According to the official missing persons report, John Rauch claims that he was on his farm, walking around his property and tending to his livestock and fields alongside his daughter, Evelyn Rauch, when she suddenly disappeared. Additionally, John Rausch would explain at a later time that it was fairly routine for Evelyn to join him while he tended to the chores of the property and that it was not unusual for Evelyn to have been around the livestock as she had already grown used to the animals. As John Rausch was tending to the cows, he had left Evelyn outside next to his barn and told his daughter to stay at the location or to explore inside the barn if she wished. As John was out in the pasture, it was at around nine in the morning that he would return to the barn to find that Evelyn was no longer standing near the structure. Believing that she had gone into the barn and was possibly hiding, John continued searching for her on his own for about an hour 
before he contacted some neighbours and friends who were known for serving as helping hands on the farm to help look for Evelyn. After spending the entire day looking for her, John and his friends were unable to find any sign of Evelyn and started to worry that she had possibly wandered off of the property within the few minutes that John had spent tending to the cows out in the pasture. Due to the fact that John's farm was roughly 12 miles outside of the small town of Rocky Mountain House, he immediately began to worry that perhaps Evelyn was lost within the nearby wilderness. The wilderness surrounding the farm was known by the locals as being an incredibly wet region, with many surrounding lakes, creeks and rivers throughout the area that could make it incredibly dangerous for Evelyn if she happened to wander into the nearby marshland. Oddly enough, it was not until late in the evening that John decided to contact the local Royal Canadian Mountain Police and begin an official search and rescue of his daughter, more than six hours after her initial disappearance. Given the fact that it had already been more than six hours since her disappearance, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police immediately began their search for Evelyn and conducted an official missing persons investigation with suspicions targeted towards the father and their friends. Due to John's strange delay in contacting the local authorities and waiting until nighttime to begin the official search, it seemed that Evelyn's father was at the center of the investigation. Fearing that the father and friends could possibly hamper efforts to find the daughter, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police immediately took charge of the search and pulled as many resources together to locate any evidence of Evelyn's whereabouts. By the 16th of July, the following day after Evelyn's disappearance, more than 150 local volunteers would join the search efforts for Evelyn Rauch, conducted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. With the search beginning at first daybreak, the teams covered the entire farm, the surrounding areas, the local sloughs, rivers, creeks and nearby pastures, as well as a two-mile radius surrounding the farm. Given the fact that the surrounding wilderness appeared to have been caked with thick mud and low-lying waters, it became imperative that the volunteers slowed down and poked down into the nearby waters to make sure that Evelyn had not been swallowed up by the elements. By the 17th of July, roughly 48 hours following the disappearance of Evelyn, more than a thousand volunteers from the surrounding area joined in on the search, with volunteers and Royal Canadian Mounted Police from nearby cities deciding to join in. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police would later describe the number of individuals joined in on the search as a small standing army, with groups of people covering every square foot of John's farm in the morning before the search began. It was at around this time that the investigation into Evelyn's father, John, started to take a strange turn. According to John, he had only been away from Evelyn for a few minutes, keeping her within sight as he worked with his cows in the pasture. However, as he turned away, within the span of a few minutes, she appeared to have disappeared and been out of sight of John's gaze. Although John had merely assumed she went into the barn, it seemed that the timing for Evelyn's disappearance was a tiny window too small for her to have used to have disappeared from the property. Luckily for the family, at around 11 in the morning, on the 17th of July, an estimated 50 hours after Evelyn's disappearance, volunteer search and rescue found Evelyn as they were travelling through a wet and camp muddy bank located near a local slough. Standing in tall grass beside a slough about a mile and a half from her home, she was crying when she was found by Joe Bertignoli, a farmer who was one of the search party. She was hurried home and found to be suffering no ill effects, except exhaustion, and was put to bed. She was unable to explain where she had been and how she had lived through two hot days and two cold nights since she vanished early Sunday. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police would later provide additional statements on the recovery that appeared to have severely doubted the normalcy of Evelyn's disappearance. One of the strangest facts surrounding her recovery was the fact that Evelyn appeared to have been found because she had been crying bitterly as if she had only just started crying as the discoverer Joe Bertignoli was within earshot. Investigators said it is highly unusual for someone this age to have the ability to cry loudly and bitterly after two days of disappearing, as by that point in time the voice would have gone hoarse from crying, or the individual would not have had enough energy to have let out a cry. Given the fact that Evelyn had been missing for two days without food or water, it was difficult to explain her ability to cry and her energy at being recovered. Additionally, despite the extreme cold and the fact that she was found wet, Evelyn appeared to have been in great condition, with no evidence of hypothermia or frostbite. 
She appeared to have had no issues with hunger or dehydration and was remarked as having returned home to sleep with a full recovery. When asked where she was or how she had disappeared, Evelyn claimed that she could not remember and believed that she had merely woken up out in the slough shortly before Joe Bertignoli had found her. The last aspect of Evelyn's recovery that search and rescue volunteers found unusual was the fact that Evelyn had been discovered within a mile and a half of the property, in an area that had already been searched several times by several different groups of volunteers. Given the fact that Evelyn was so close to the property, it seemed incredibly difficult to explain why she would not have responded to people calling out to her or to have been within earshot of those passing by the area. According to the details of the official report, it was almost as if Evelyn had disappeared and then reappeared two days into the future in a nearby area, with no time for her having passed in the interim. The number of people who go missing varies from year to year and from country to country. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System in the United States, there were approximately 600,000 individuals reported missing in 2020. However, many of these cases are quickly resolved and the individual is found safe, leaving a smaller number of long-term missing persons cases. The location of where people disappear the most can vary depending on the region and the factors involved. In general, the majority of missing person cases occur in urban or densely populated areas where there are higher concentrations of people. However, there are also certain areas that are known for having a higher frequency of missing person cases, such as national parks and other remote wilderness areas. In the United States, for example, the National Park Service reports that there have been over 1,600 missing persons cases in national parks and other federal lands over the past decade. Other areas where people disappear frequently include highways and other transportation routes. In addition, there are also cases of people disappearing close to areas where there's water, such as lakes and rivers, which can be difficult to search due to the lack of visibility and other hazards. The Mount Ararat anomaly is a mysterious feature seen on satellite images of Mount Ararat, the highest peak in Turkey. The anomaly appears to be a large boat-shaped object embedded in the snow and ice on the mountain slopes, resembling the legendary vessel known as Noah's Ark. The anomaly has attracted the attention of explorers, archaeologists and scholars for decades, who have debated its authenticity and attempted to uncover the truth behind its origin. Just recently, someone on social media said they spotted a huge trail behind the object in an old photograph, saying that this could have been where the boat crashed on the mountain. They also pointed out that these marks can be seen on the ocean floor, where there's movement of large rocks, saying that they leave these same markings. The user also asked how such a large structure would be able to end up high on a mountain and suggested that it was placed there due to a huge flood. Interestingly, various civilizations talk about and have documented a great flood, and believers use this as proof that a worldwide event happened. The story of a great flood that destroyed most of the world's population is not unique to any single ancient civilization. In fact, it appears in the mythology and folklore of many cultures across the globe, including the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Greeks, Egyptians, and Native Americans, among others. The idea of a universal flood has puzzled historians, scientists, and theologians for centuries, and numerous theories have been proposed to explain its occurrence and significance. One of the most popular theories regarding the Great Flood is that it was a natural disaster, perhaps caused by a large meteor or comet impact, a massive earthquake, or a volcanic eruption. According to this theory, the floodwaters would have been caused by melting ice caps or heavy rainfalls, and they would have covered vast areas of land, destroying entire civilizations and wiping out much of the world's flora and fauna. Another theory suggests that the Great Flood was a metaphorical or symbolic event, meant to represent a spiritual or philosophical truth rather than a historical fact. According to this view, the Flood represents a universal purification or renewal, a kind of spiritual baptism that wipes away the sins and imperfections of humanity and allows for a new beginning. Some historians and archaeologists have suggested that the story of the Great Flood may have been inspired by an actual historical event, such as the flooding of the Black Sea around 7,500 years ago. This catastrophic event is believed to have destroyed many coastal settlements and forced thousands of people to flee to higher ground, which could have inspired the creation of flood myths and legends. 
Another theory suggests that the Great Flood may have been a cultural memory of the end of the last ice age, which would have caused significant changes to the Earth's climate, sea levels, and geography. This theory suggests that the flood stories may have been a way for ancient peoples to explain these changes and their own place in the world. Regardless of the cause or origin of the Great Flood, it remains a powerful and enduring story that continues to fascinate people across cultures and generations. Interestingly, the Central Intelligence Agency came forward and talked about the object, noting that a spy satellite had taken a photograph of a strange object in the shape of a boat high up on the mountain. The document which was released through a Freedom of Information Act request reveals the following. Dr. Carver is considered to be America's foremost authority on intelligence and security. He served as Deputy for National Intelligence to two former directors of the CIA and as the senior U.S. intelligence officer in NATO. He is a Yale graduate and has a doctorate from Oxford University. He is the only person in the history of the CIA to be twice awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Medal. Title of Dr. Carver's speech, We cannot afford surprises. We must be prepared to prevent them. Dr. Carver was questioned by a West Point graduate, and while they were a cadet at the academy in 1973, they heard a strong rumor going around that a United States military spy satellite was flying down the Turkish corridor, taking photographs of a Soviet missile site, and apparently accidentally took photographs on the Turkish side of a large wooden object which appeared to be a ship stuck in a glacier about 14,000 feet on Mount Ararat. There were strong rumors going around the academy at that time, suggesting that the CIA might have classified photographs of Noah's Ark. Dr. Carver responded that they do remember that at the time there were some pictures taken, and there were clear indications that there was something up on Mount Ararat, which was rather strange. There were various archaeological expeditions that were mounted. The Turkish government was not too thrilled about supporting them, because it was getting into an area that was politically dicey. Dr. Carver explained that he hadn't been to the site, and wasn't sure if anyone from the United States had either, but did note that the first five books of the Bible might not be all that bad at history, as various parallels have been documented. The first reported sighting of the anomaly dates back to the 1950s, when a Turkish airline pilot noticed a strange object on the mountain while flying over it. In the years that followed, various expeditions were organized to investigate the anomaly, but none of them provided definitive proof of its existence or nature. In the 1970s, a group of Turkish and American researchers led by Ron Wyatt claimed to have found the remains of Noah's Ark on the mountain. According to their account, they discovered a large boat-shaped structure buried in the ice and rocks near the summit of the mountain. They claimed that the structure had the exact dimensions described in the Bible for Noah's Ark, and that it was made of a type of wood that could have survived for thousands of years in the extreme conditions of the mountain. However, the claims made by Wyatt and his team were met with skepticism and controversy, as they provided no tangible evidence to support their findings. Critics argued that the structure they found could be a natural rock formation or a glacial deposit, and that the dimensions they measured were inconsistent with the Bible's description of the Ark. Since then, several other expeditions have attempted to investigate the Mount Ararat anomaly and uncover its true nature. Some have used ground-penetrating radar and other advanced technologies to scan the mountain's surface and subsurface, while others have relied on traditional methods such as hiking and climbing. Despite decades of research and exploration, the Mount Ararat anomaly remains a mystery, with no conclusive evidence to confirm or refute its existence as Noah's Ark. The controversy and fascination surrounding the anomaly have led to numerous theories and speculations ranging from the supernatural to the scientific. As of right now, the Mount Ararat anomaly is a highly debated feature on the mountain that has captured the imagination of people for decades, and while some believe it to be the remains of Noah's Ark, others argue that it is a natural formation or a product of human imagination, while others suggest that the artifact is genuine and that evidence is being hidden from the general public. Regardless of its true nature, the anomaly continues to intrigue and inspire curiosity among those who seek to uncover the secrets of the world's ancient past. Interestingly, our history is filled with mysterious gaps, but one of those that we are starting to better understand is that of the younger Dryas impact hypothesis. 
The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis is a scientific theory that suggests that a catastrophic impact or airburst occurred over North America at the end of the last ice age, around 12,800 years ago. The theory proposes that this event led to a rapid cooling of the Earth's climate and the onset of a period known as the Younger Dryas, which lasted for over a thousand years. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis was first proposed in 2007 by a team of scientists led by Richard Firestone, a nuclear chemist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. The theory is based on the discovery of high levels of rare elements, such as platinum and iridium, in sediments dated to the Younger Dryas period, which are thought to be indicative of an impact. The scientists also identified microspherules, nanodiamonds, and other exotic materials in the sediments that they argued could only have been produced by an impact. Since the initial proposal of the theory, there has been much debate and controversy surrounding it, with some scientists questioning the validity of the evidence and others offering alternative explanations for the unusual materials found in the sediments. Some have suggested that the high levels of rare elements could have been deposited by volcanic activity or by a meteorite shower rather than a single impact event. Despite these theories, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis continues to be an active area of research with new evidence and arguments being put forward by both supporters and skeptics. Some scientists argue that the impact may have been responsible for the extinction of large mammals, such as the mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger, while others suggest that it may have played a role in the development of human civilization. While the younger Dryas impact hypothesis remains a topic of debate and discussion among scientists, it highlights the ongoing efforts to understand the complex interactions between the Earth and the universe and the potential impact that cosmic events can have on our planet and its history. An asteroid impact is one of the most catastrophic events that could occur on Earth, and it has happened before. One of the most famous examples is that of the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. But an asteroid impact can also have a more immediate effect on the planet, causing a massive flood. When an asteroid hits the Earth, the impact can cause a shock wave that generates a lot of heat, melting the surrounding rock and vaporizing the asteroid. The vaporized rock and asteroid debris then shoot up into the atmosphere and fall back down to Earth, causing massive wildfires around the impact site. The shock wave can also cause a tsunami if the asteroid hits the ocean. The tsunami can be several hundred feet high and can travel thousands of miles, causing widespread destruction along the coastlines. But the real danger comes from the impact's long-term effects on the Earth's climate. The asteroid impact throws a large amount of dust and debris into the atmosphere, which blocks out the sun's rays and cools the Earth's surface. This can lead to a nuclear winter effect, where the Earth's temperature drops significantly, causing widespread crop failures and famine. The cooling effect can last for several years, and it is during this time that the flood occurs. The cooling effect causes the ice caps to expand, and the increased weight of the ice on the land can cause the Earth's crust to sink. This creates a bowl-shaped depression that can trap water from melting ice caps and rainfall, causing a massive flood. The flood can last for several years until the Earth's crust slowly rises back up to its original position. The evidence for this scenario comes from the study of geological records, which show that there have been several catastrophic floods in the Earth's past that were likely caused by an asteroid impact. For example, there is evidence that the impact that caused the demise of the dinosaurs also caused a massive flood in what is now the United States and Mexico. As of right now, scientists and researchers have said that an asteroid impact can cause a massive flood by generating a shock wave that causes tsunamis, blocking out the sun's rays and cooling the Earth's surface, and causing the ice caps to expand and trap water in a depression on the Earth's surface. The evidence for this scenario comes from the study of geological records, and it is a reminder of the destructive power of nature. So, what do you make of these interesting discoveries and announcements, and do you think Noah's Ark is on this mountain? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below, and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.